Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Lenten journey, Companions Along the Way. I'm Patty Ames, the Canon for Christian Formation, and continue to walk with you as we are on our journey through Lent. As has been our custom, we'll have a moment of silence and then a poem to help us focus on our Lenten journey with another moment of silence. I encourage you to take a deep breath in and let it go and still yourselves as we begin this evening. The Disciples by Anne Weems. Hurting, they came to him. Healed, they followed him. Grateful, they gave to him what they had and what they were. Blessed, they became a blessing and went out to all the world in his name. Those who are hurt and healed, grateful and blessed, still move among us in his name. Tonight, we have the privilege and pleasure of the Reverend Dr. Nina Salmon joining us to talk about parts of her faith journey. I first met Nina when we were freshmen at Randolph-Macon Women's College, now Randolph College in Lynchburg, where we were in Old Testament and freshman English together. Our professor was Dr. Elizabeth Lipscomb, the wife of the Reverend Lloyd Lipscomb. Nina now serves as an associate at St. Paul's, the associate for youth and families, and she is also an associate professor of English and the director of senior symposium at the University of Lynchburg. Nina is what we call a bivocational priest. Nina, welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, Patty. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to see faces of those I have uh, walked along this journey with and some friends I don't know and some of you um, are listed just by first name so I'm having fun imagining who you might be as well uh, but thank you for joining us uh, and Patty thank you for doing these series they have emerged from COVID as something um, I can't imagine ever doing without so uh, you started these a couple of years ago in the diocese and they have just been a gift to all of us um, during lockdown and now when we can get together uh, in person, that's great. But the opportunity to, to have this community that uh, expands beyond just our local place to um, parts far and wide. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to get to see each other in this way. Well, thank you, Nina, I appreciate that. Um, as we begin, as we've started each time, I invite our guests, friends that have been companions and still are companions for me on my spiritual journey, um, to tell us a little bit about your life narrative and, and your spiritual journey, Nina. I have listened to the um, previous recordings. I, I haven't been able to be here on Tuesday nights, but I have listened to them and um, I have so enjoyed hearing from Lisa and from Sally and from the boys, um, from the boys home and hearing their journeys. And I was somewhat prepared for that question. So uh, I had an opportunity to think about it. Um, this is Grace. She will be with us throughout this uh, discussion as well. So sorry about the disruption. Um, but it, it occurred to me as I was thinking about my spiritual path and journey, uh, it occurred to me that it is not a straight line. It has not been a straight line. Uh, so path is a little bit of a misnomer. So I need to start by uh, giving you a different metaphor. Uh, and some of you of a certain age will remember, um, I think it was a, a 1970s maybe implement called Spirograph. Do you remember that? All right, so it was a little plastic thing and you put the pen in it and it went around and around and around and uh, as the pen went through the, the plastic hole, it created um, designs and circles and um, that's the best image I can come up with for what my spiritual journey has been. It has been a series of um, 
of overlapping uh, circles uh, that have encountered one another in unexpected ways, sometimes uh, just barely touching the borders of another um, circle, sometimes digging in deep and making a rich pattern uh, that gets deeper and richer. Um, and as I thought in particular, Patty, about our mutual paths, um, I think that's an, a, a metaphor that speaks to our journey uh, that has initially touched just peripherally uh, in our time at Randolph-Macon um, and then intersected again and then again and then again. Um, we're now in our, what, maybe fourth iteration of, um, of encountering one another in the same space and time. Um, and our friendship has never waned, um, but we have um, become... Um, spiritual friends over time. We started out as, as uh, um, help mates to one another to try to soldier through some difficult course material and circumstances maybe. Um, and then over time we have found our mutual love of God and we have found a spiritual friendship that didn't really emerge when we were college freshmen because we were way too cool for that. Um, Although I do need to now tell the story um, that will, I think, demonstrate that at 18, I was measurably cooler than Patty. Yes. Um, at least in this one instance. Uh, so Patty and I, as, as you know, were classmates in, in Old Testament. She was a better student than I was. And she's the one who said, you have got to study for this midterm or you will fail. So we did. Uh, gather at Hojo's and study for hours with lots of coffee. And I did pass that class, um, thanks to Patty and coffee. And uh, in English, a class where I was predisposed to do pretty well, um, I think I was doing okay, but Patty really racked it in when our very first assignment was to write about our best friend. And uh, I'll never forget this. Um, Patty got her paper back and Dr. Lipscomb, in her great wisdom and grace, had written, um, Patty had written about her best friend, God. God was Patty's best friend. And Dr. Lipscomb had written, can't grade God, but your English gets a B. Yeah. And I have, I have treasured that comment. I don't know if Patty would remember if I didn't repeat it all the time, but uh, that was a, a brilliant comment. And I'm sorry, I just broke all the FERPA rules and outed you on your grade. I actually don't remember if that was the right grade, but we're gonna go with that. Um, I'll take the B. Thanks. Yeah, take the B. That's a good rule of thumb is to take the B. Uh, but Patty had written about God and, and Dr. Lipscomb was, was gonna refrain from grading God, but she did grade the English and it got a good grade. Let's just say that. <laughs> I wrote about my best friend, Susan and riding ponies, but um, Patty wrote about God. So that was pretty good. So our, our, our paths have overlapped and intertwined and it strikes me that uh, so much of my life has been um, overlapping paths with, with wonderful um, clergy and, and lay leaders who have, uh, and human beings in the world who have informed me and shaped my uh, understanding of what it means to, um, to, to be, to be in this world, um, to, to be a leader, to, uh, to, shape, um, to shape lives, uh, to, uh, to love people, to um, do the good work. Um, Dr. Lipscomb, Elizabeth is one of those who has intersected. <laughs> Dr. Lipscomb and Lloyd were at my baptism. Um, Elizabeth was in high school with my father and Lloyd's with, Lloyd was in seminary with my father. Uh, so they were at my baptism and re-entered my life when I was in college uh, and have re-entered my life now again uh, as parishioners at St. Paul's. So that's, that's just another example of, a, of an intersection that has um, spiraled in, spiraled out, uh, continued throughout and um, gotten richer and deeper um, along the way. There have been many of those. And those paths, whether they be spiritual or otherwise, are, are not straight. So 
you became a priest later in life, but you found a, a, another vocation first. I got the B, so I didn't go into English. Um, it took me a while to find my vocation. But um, tell us about your early call um, in your vocation as a professor and a teacher. Sure. So um, the B was the high bar for me. Uh, that was the best grade I got that semester. Um, which was otherwise known as the academic probation semester, my first semester of college. Uh, so I didn't think academics was really gonna be in it for me. Uh, it was just a matter of survival. Um, I was very homesick and away from home for the first time. I uh, grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, so I really did not intend to be an English teacher like my mother um, or a priest like my father. Um, in fact, I was gonna be anything but a teacher like my mother or work in the church like my father because uh, being somewhat contrarian and a teenager uh, was never going to follow either of those two paths. I had my own plans, um, but you know what they say about making plans and what God does when you make those plans or tell God those plans. Uh, so my, my uh, unbeknownst to me career unfolded um, soon after Randolph-Macon uh, when I came back to Lynchburg um, because I, I dated a townie. And I tell my students at Lynchburg now, be careful who you date because <laughs> you may end up right back here. If you don't like Lynchburg, then just uh, stay inside your dorm room and don't go out in, in Lynchburg. Um, so I met Jerry Salmon uh, when I was a senior and went off to Atlanta um, briefly and returned uh, about six weeks later. And um, we were married a year after that. Uh, and he was a teacher. So um, I, I think uh, the many teachers in my family and uh, my husband, who was a teacher, I had always admired teachers, but never really thought I would be one uh, myself, but fell into that um, in some happy ways. And um, I, I have lived into both of my vocations backwards. Um, I guess it's a matter of testing them out first. Uh, and then getting the credential. So I um, taught high school for a few years and uh, then was working on my teacher certification at Lynch, then Lynchburg College and never did get my teacher certification, but along the way I got my master's degree, uh, which then certified me to be able to teach English. I had the credentials to teach English with a master's degree at the college level. Um, and by the time I had the, the third boy, it was time to stay home for a little while um, and not teach at the private school where I was teaching and un unable to make enough money to cover a babysitter at that time. Um, so I did start teaching at night uh, at the community college. Um, and after about four years of doing that, I began teaching at uh, VMI and at Lynchburg College as an adjunct. Um, and a couple of years after that, uh, discovered that I enjoyed it and was, was good at it. And so fell into uh, a more full-time work at Lynchburg College, uh, teaching mostly composition classes. And um, 15 years later, <laughs> um, went and got the degree that most of my colleagues had uh, prior to entering that field. So 15 years of college teaching at the University of Lynchburg plus four on top of that. So nearly 20 years of college teaching. And I went to Virginia Tech uh, during a sabbatical year and uh, pursued a PhD um, in interdisciplinary studies. It was um, a program called Aspect. And it was during that year that I dis determined that I was probably headed for seminary and uh, shifted my work from um, looking at Anne Spencer, Harlem Renaissance poet, to uh, the racial integration of the Episcopal Diocese of Southwestern Virginia. So uh, same area of minority responses to oppression, um, but uh, shifted to church. Um, the bishop's papers, the diocesan papers were all at the archives at Virginia Tech. Uh, it was a rich vein of, of study that I thoroughly enjoyed and um, it allowed me to turn my face towards what was next. And what was next was um, completing the PhD, which took me the full um, six years in between sabbaticals. And uh, I defended my uh, dissertation in 
um, April of 2016 and got my revisions in in June and started um, clinical pastoral education, the 400 hour course at the hospital that, that same week and went off to um, Suwannee for my second sabbatical um, and did a year at Suwannee. Um, did miserably on the GOEs, the general ordination exams that most people take at the end of three years and I took at the end of three months. Um, so that was no surprise to people who knew, knew better. It was a surprise to me. I thought I'd do better than that, but um, that was my arrogance. And um, I did pass some of them, just not enough of them. Uh, so I came home and regrouped and figured out how I could do another uh, emergency semester. Um, came home and taught for a semester and then did a, a re-up, one, one of my friends called a victory lap. Uh, went back to Suwannee, took a leave from University of Lynchburg and did a second semester there and some online work uh, through um, Berkeley at California, uh, CDSP, uh, Church Divinity School of the Pacific and some other bits and pieces here and there and cobbled together enough. Um, one of the members of the Commission on Ministry told me there was more to being a priest than academics, Nina. And um, I really wanted to do well on the academic part. Um, so uh, late in life became um, ordained and credentialed to do the thing that I had, had found in my heart for many years. Um, so I'm old professor, new priest. That's what, I, that's what I tell people. I did have one colleague tell me that the, the shine was, was wearing off a little bit and I needed to quit playing that new priest card. Uh, <laughs> so, Thank you for sharing that. I want to go back to your time of teaching for a little bit and ask you at, at any point during your teaching time, did you see that as a ministry? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, I think any of us who have a career uh, that we consider a vocation, uh, a calling would, would probably lean into that answer with a, with a big yes, that it is a ministry. If, if we are called, if we are, um, um, I have sons, some who live to work and some who work to live. Um, so the, the work that, that teaching is for me is a vocation. It is a calling. So yes, um, that is a ministry for me. Um, that is very much living out um, what I must do as uh, who God made me to be and who I am called to be. Um, so that gets at the root of my, the, the heart and soul of, of I guess, my, my theology and my understanding of um, who God is and who God calls me to be. Uh, that is my, um, my um, you can call it a lens or a meta narrative. That's how I see the world is um, through the understanding of we are created in the image of God and God loves us and we are beloved by God and each individual person is worthy of dignity and God's love. And that's how we treat each other. And uh, we are in this world created for community, created for relationship. Um, and that, that makes some of the difficult students easier to take sometimes. Um, it makes uh, the hard days a little bit uh, easier to get through. And it does, I think, remind me always that there's something more at stake than just um, the sentence structure of that one paper or the whether or not it's on time. Of course, there are always the parameters that go with every assignment and all of the pieces, but first and foremost, every student is a child of God. And that uh, makes my job wonderful. Yeah. So it is a ministry for sure. Thanks. So now as you come and, and you've merged these two, can you talk a little bit about what it means to be bivocational and and how that works out? Yeah, I'm still figuring that out. So if you have any thoughts on that, <laughs> let me know. I think um, you're doing pretty well. That, yeah, well, so but I, I will jump in before I'll let you think about it for a second, because so you teach and you're at um, St. Paul's a couple of days during the week and on Sundays. 
But there's an old adage in the church that I'll tell people is there's no such thing as part-time work, only part-time pay. Um, and I think that's uh, from what I have seen of your ministry and working with you now as a colleague in ministry in this diocese, um, you give a, a lot more time. And um, I think both your students and your parish are, are blessed by um, your ministries in each place. But I, I think it's something not as many people are familiar with of, of having a bivocational priest. Well, thank you for saying that. And my senior warden's on here, so I don't really want to say this, but I do it whether they paid me or not. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's it's great. And and I see people on the screen who work, who do the work for the church. Um, I was doing it anyway, you know, I was doing it before ordination. Um, so it's, that too is vocation. And I certainly didn't sign up to teach for the money. <laughs> so um, that's, secondary to me and unimportant. Um, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say it's unimportant because it's senior warden, it's not unimportant, um, but truly uh, I love being able to do both things. So uh, I'm saying too much to you close friends right here under our collective cone of silence. I, this is gonna be recorded, the whole world can see it, but whatever. Um, if I get fed up in one area, I can flip to the other. <laughs> So it's, for me, it's great because I have the best of all the worlds um, and I do have serious FOMO, fear of missing out. So I don't like to miss out on anything. And this way I can do all the things. Today I had a great day. I was at, I was at school and then I went to our clericus meeting where I saw Patty. <laughs> um, it was at Grace. Martin, I see you up there. So it was at Grace Memorial. Uh, and then I, then I went to St. Paul's. And then I went back to school. So it was a, it was a great day. That was, that was a happy day for me. Um, I, I like doing all the things that I get to do and I feel really lucky to get to do it. I will say that um, I am somebody who <laughs> has a hard time with the stop button. Um, so having another job uh, does put a hard line on my time sometimes. And so I am not able to <laughs> be like some of the people who are part-time on the screen, maybe, uh, who give 100%, 150% to their part-time job. I do, I work part-time uh, because I don't have full-time hours to give. So 100% of my heart, but um, only part of my time. Um, the yeah. bivocational thing, uh, it, I, as I, when I said, I'm still figuring it out. Um, I'll just tell you this story. I did when I was newly ordained uh, in 2018, uh, I did um, out myself to the very first summer class that I had as a newly ordained priest in the Episcopal Church. And I was excited and um, it was big news and it, things didn't go well in that class. <laughs> um, there were assumptions about what I might be interested in. There were assumptions in my stance on particular things that students might be writing about. And I did, don't lead with that any longer. Um, I wait a little bit into the semester for it to either come up naturally or um, sometimes it doesn't come up. So sometimes students, I don't present myself as an ordained person uh, any, anymore. I, I have not changed who I am uh, in any way, but I don't always announce that. So I'm going to throw you a curveball. Nina and I talked before. some before, um, and but it, it dawned on me as you were talking earlier that your mom was a teacher and, and your dad was a priest, and, and I know your mom, knew your dad. Um, Nina's dad was my first bishop when I served in my first church in Virginia Beach. He was the bishop of the Diocese of Southern Virginia and a mentor for me. So here's my question. Tell me one thing that you got from your mom about teaching that has helped you in that vocation and one thing you got from your dad. Um, Without filters. Okay, here's what pops yeah. into my head about my mom. Uh, <laughs> so uh, part of my interest in um, race and in minority responses to oppression comes from my high school experience in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I was in the late 1970s, part of the 
um, busing that happened in Charlotte. And my um, small white neighborhood was bused to integrate the large, formerly all black West Charlotte high school. Um, and my mother came when I was a junior to teach Latin and English at West Charlotte High School. My mom was an awesome teacher. Um, she had taught in, at William Fleming and uh, she actually taught um, under, I think she taught Bill Coulter. There's another little overlap. <laughs> um, he was my, I, my English teacher, my English professor at Randolph-Macon and uh, Ann Coulter was the former organist at St. Paul's and they became dear friends um, when I arrived at St. Paul's. Um, having feared Dr. Coulter all of my <laughs> young adult life. Um, she taught under Dr. Coulter's father at William Fleming in, in Roanoke. I mean, there's another little intersection there. And she had taught at North Cross in Roanoke. Uh, so she was a seasoned teacher. She taught at West Charlotte High School and she taught um, uh, not always the upper level classes, but all levels. And um, she was beloved by all. Um, and in particular, for whatever, well, probably because she's a big sports fan, the football team liked her. So she had a lot of a big, burly, strong students who were um, taking Latin from her. And she would often pull one of those in, one of those big football players in if she was had, had an unruly class to help, you know, sort of be like the bouncer. And she, she would say, do you see this football player? This is my friend and you need to behave or, or my friend will, will <laughs> escort you out. To the principal's office. So she, she ruled with an iron fist. She also, you know, offered the advice that, you know, you just needed to kill one student on the first day of class and nail the body outside the door and then nobody will mess with you. So that's, that was her advice. And she meant it metaphorically. Um, she meant it, you know, come out, come out tough and then uh, you can lighten up. So um, they had very different parenting styles as well. Um, so yeah, she was tough in that way. Um, and then maybe would relent. Uh, I still, to this day, do what she says, pretty much. I and, do too. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so, I mean, why would you, she's usually right anyway. I mean, almost always right. So why would we do anything differently? Um, I have great admiration for my mother and she is a spiritual you know, guide for me as well. She has a, a lot to, to do with my spiritual formation, not just my dad, the priest. Um, my dad, the, I've thought a lot about what I learned from him. And the, the best thing that I, I learned from him, and I, I remember this, I remember asking <laughs> um, specifically, um, it was after 2003 in the election of Gene Robinson, uh, the openly gay bishop in the Episcopal church. And there was some fraught feelings in the church. And dad was back at St. John's Lynchburg. He was uh, an interim there. I was a preacher's kid once again. I dreamed that I got my tongue pierced. That was my um, acting out. <laughs> I just dreamed it. I didn't do it. I, I just dreamed it. Um, he led some discussions at St. John's uh, to, to have to listen, to, to have people talk about their feelings. And I remember his saying, um, and, and some of you may have participated uh, in some of those discussions. Alice, I see you. Um, but my, I remember my dad saying, you never wanna make anybody feel bad about their opinions, about their position. And that, that really sticks with me now because I, I mean, there's some people who I have disagreed with politically uh, and sometimes in my own family. And sometimes I wanna make some of my own family members feel bad about their positions, <laughs> but I would, I would never. Um, because I remember that lesson that was really important. And it, it goes to our baptismal covenant, Patty. I mean, it goes, you know, I know that's important to you. The baptismal covenant is something that's just so, um, such a good guide for us. And if, if we don't respect the dignity of every human being, then, then you know, if we, if we disrespect or diminish or reduce or humiliate or embarrass, then we're not, we're not following that, that covenant. We're, we're off base. Right. So that was a really important lesson from my dad and my dad's sense of humor was uh, tremendous as well. Um, that's, that's uh, not always appropriate. His was not always. Yes. Appropriate. <laughs> uh, so I try to behave a little bit better. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing those. Um, so th those are, uh, 
all three of you, your mom and your dad, and, and you have been companions for me on my spiritual journey. Um, and, and you've talked about a, a couple of people, but um, it, who walks with you on your spiritual journey? Who are the, some of those people, maybe in the past or, or now? And, and then who, who do you walk with? Yeah. Uh, so many people. So, you know, I, I was surrounded all of my life by, um, you know, wonderful clergy, certainly. Um, and incredible lay leaders. Um, it was important to me growing up that I have relationships with those lay leaders and that has shaped my understanding of the importance of uh, non-parental adult humans in the lives of teenagers <laughs> because that was so important to me. Um, so the, the, the strong lay leaders in the church um, who put up with me <laughs> uh, when I was a a rocky teenager um, have walked with me because they had confidence that I was going to do the right thing or, or, you know, straighten it out. Um, my friends, I have a solid group of childhood friends. I've just come back from a wonderful week with, with a group that I lean on for everything. Um, my, my family, um, <laughs> My husband, fortunately, was, I say fortunately, was a Catholic um, because he kind of was indoctrinated, I guess. He was raised uh, in the church and he went to Catholic schools. And so, you know, he didn't marry somebody who was going to be a priest. That was not what he signed up for. Um, but he adapted very nicely. And um, his favorite way to get me to stop chirping at him at night is to say Shh, I'm praying and he knows that'll that'll shut me up that'll make me stop talking right away but he you know he gets it and uh he has he has been a spiritual companion which was not how we started out for sure uh back in the day um but you know I hope he can't hear me saying that because I don't want to give him too many get his head all swelled up <laughs> um so my my family for sure my friends uh, and, and the lay leaders. I am so fortunate to be um, in a parish now where, um, and I, I hope we're going to talk about this, Patty. We, you know, you and I have been companions along this way, and you pointed out something that I hadn't thought about, but much of our companionship comes from a, a hard place. And I'll start with the parish and then I'll let you fill in the, the backstory. But um, St. Paul's Lynchburg has had a hard year and <laughs> they have been just wonderful companions along the way for me. Um, the, the clergy team, Bill Bumgarner, the, the deacon has, has been just a rock and um, Todd Vi is the best there is. Um, you all heard Susan Carroll, the talented musician who is a minister to all in so many ways. Um, and uh, Mike Patch, who is the, the um, he's gifted in so many ways too, who does the technology and Sumner Jenkins, who is the organist and the choir master, who is the, the brother of, of a, an Episcopal priest. And his other brother, I think is a clergy person in another denomination. And both of his parents were Episcopal priests. Uh, my father sent his mother to seminary, I think. So it, it, I, it's a phenomenal team in place. Um, so I feel very fortunate to have landed there. And I don't think it was accidental. I think God had a hand in that for sure. Um, so yeah, anybody who wants to walk with me gets to walk with me because I'm an extrovert and all of the people who walk with me end up being part of that spiritual journey. Um, but I do want to circle back, Patty, and let me throw it back at you. Do you want to say something about what, what you what you unearthed about our connections. Yeah, Nina and I were talking yesterday and uh, as I prepare and, and think about these friendships that I've had with people, um, with Nina, it, it certainly started out as fun in college, um, but my mother died um, right after my freshman year in college. Um, and having friends support you through that, um, was very important. I don't think I could have gotten through college if it hadn't been for those friends that that were there for me. 
Um, and, you know, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, as I told Nina, but, but the thing that is difficult is dealing with death. Um, and, and we've dealt with that on each side of our family, with family members, and then most recently um, with the, the death of Diane Vi um, and, and a sudden death that um, was very difficult for the parish. Um, but fortunately, through this tight group of leadership, um, and I spent last summer there helping and supporting, but walking through that, um, and, and that's part of why I wanted to do this series, because you don't get through those things alone. And the parish was walking together um, with the staff, um, and, and it's a with. Um, sometimes someone might be ahead of you or, or behind, but most of the time I, I feel that we're walking with each other. And that's why I used that picture at the beginning. Um, it was from my pilgrimage to the Holy Land of, of walking with people on this journey. And I think especially in Lent to reflect on that. And, and even during those most difficult times, it's easy to think about those companions on our journey and the, the good times and the easy times. But to walk through those difficult times of a, a parent's death or a cousin's death, um, a co-worker and a, a dear friend's death, um, I, I just give thanks for those companions along the way and, and feel it's a gift from God um, to have those folks and, and, and all of you all, because we're all walking together tonight as we might share our stories. Um, but it's it's a bigger story and we're all part of God's story as beloved children of God. So Patty didn't tell my part of the story, but um, my, on, I guess it was Patty's second lap. So we were in college yeah. together. The next time we encountered each other, uh, she was in the diocese uh, where my dad was bishop and uh, I had little boys, I guess, because um, I remember chasing them and seeing Patty and my dad was just enthralled with Patty. He thought she was just the best thing coming down the pike ever and was so impressed with me because I knew her. <laughs> so I got some collateral um, kudos. And uh, so I, I said her name aloud to Frank Dunn, who was the rector at St. John's when he was looking for a director of Christian ed and Frank followed up on it and Patty ended up back in Lynchburg and uh, and was at St. John's Lynchburg as the director of Christian ed for how many years? Six? Was there for four. Four, okay, um, four short years. Um, but during those four years, um, my, uh, my cousin who was a senior at UVA committed suicide in his fraternity house. And my other cousin, his sister, his older sister, who I'm very close to, um, seven years younger than I am, um, she was a nanny for um, local doctors, um, Kathy and Gary Stewart. And um, my parents called me in the middle of the night and uh, it was 30 in the morning and said, you have to go get Catherine and tell her that Jay has died and take her to Bedford where her parents live. And um, I called Patty immediately and said, Patty, Patty knew Catherine from Camp Allegheny. And uh, I said, Patty, you have to go with me. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, she did, she didn't bat an eye. I didn't hesitate to call her either. And the two of us went over and told Catherine that, that Jay had died and, um, and then drove Catherine to Bedford. That was a real act of friendship on Patty's part. That was hard, hard stuff. And I couldn't have done that without her, so. And then she left, my children didn't wear pants and uh, she left. <laughs> And I don't think that was the causal. Um, okay, good. Uh, but my children didn't wear pants. And uh, Patty left and went to St. Columbus for 20, 21, 21 years. 21 years. And then I came back to this diocese because I heard about the job and called Nina and said, tell me what you think about coming back to the diocese of uh, Southwestern Virginia. And um, now we have the privilege and, and pleasure of working with each other um, as colleagues and in ministry and, and renewing that friendship again. Um, 
So it's a, a lot of intersections. Um, there's one companion we talked about um, the other night as well that I wanted to bring up. Um, he died recently, um, former presiding Bishop Frank Griswold, and just wanted to give you a chance to talk about Frank for a moment. Yeah, so the year that um, my parents moved to Lynchburg, uh, dad retired in 1998. My grand, my great aunt and grandmother lived in Bedford and my great aunt, my mother grew up in Bedford. My dad had lived across the street from them in Bedford. Um, when he was in high school, my mother grew up in Bedford. He, he did moved there when he was in high school. Um, but my great aunt was not doing well. And so they, they came a little early, retired a little bit early, um, earlier than they had planned. And, um, I'd lobbied hard for them to come to Lynchburg because I had these three little boys who didn't wear pants and I needed someone to help me get them to wear pants. And so they came in 1998 and, um, the year that they, my dad retired, my mother took on a job as the, um, the interim director of the presiding bishops fund for world relief. Um, it, it is now Episcopal Relief and Development um, is, is what it's called now, but it was then the Presiding Bishops Fund for World Relief. 1998 was the year that Hurricane Mitch hit and uh, she had been on the board for many years. And I remember, I think I had to schedule the third son's birth around her trip to Nicaragua. <laughs> so she, um, she was in Central America a lot uh, during their little early years. I said, most grandmothers go to the mall. You're going to Central America again. Could you please stay home a little bit? Uh, but she had work to do. Uh, so she was a great model for that. Um, but she commuted to New York from Forest, Virginia. So she would leave on Tuesday morning and she would come home on Friday. And she worked closely with, with um, Frank and Phoebe Griswold. Um, so when Frank died, it was, I, I told her, I don't, I saw the news before she did and I had to tell her and she was so sad. Um, so he was a wonderful, wonderful spiritual leader. And, um, I do, I'm, I know Patty puts links up for you. I have been praying with one of his books. It's a wonderful, I didn't bring it in. I meant to, and I didn't, um, cause it's in my car. I keep it in my car. Um, it's a little companion book. Uh, I think it's called praying our days. If any of you have it. Um, and I, I have my mother's copy that he, he inscribed. Um, so I'll, I'll put that, I'll give that to you, Patty, so you can put that link in there. But he was just a lovely man. He was spiritual director for many of the uh, faculty at Suwannee. So he came to Suwannee a couple of times. And one time he was there when my mother was there. And so he came over to the house. He and Phoebe came over to the house. And um, some of my seminary friends remember that he was there and they, they were so excited because it was a big deal that Frank Griswold, the former presiding bishop, was there and uh, they got to meet him. Um, while he was there, my mother bought him some Suwannee flannel night uh, pajama pants and um, he called them his leisure pants. And so <laughs> she always asked about his leisure pants. He, yeah, I guess he was too dignified to have pajama pants, but that's, that's a little story about Frank Griswold. Yeah. So I just want to hold him up as a saint of the, of the church and yeah. a wonderful human being. Thank and you for that. Yeah. A companion for many on their spiritual journey, yeah. just a Absolutely. lovely man. Um, so thank you. As we've been talking about the broad journey, I would invite you to talk a little bit about Lenten journey. Um, it, however, that path may, may work for you or walk for you. Um, and any, practices or things that you're reading or listening to how do you experience your Lenten journey I have long uh had several things that I would give up for Lent um and I was talking to a friend who is uh ordained Presbyterian colleague of mine at University of Lynchburg and she said why your life is hard enough do not give that up <laughs> and uh, I thought about that and I thought, huh, okay, maybe I'll lean into my disciplines a little bit more and take some things on. Um, I also went on that uh, a big trip with my, my childhood best friends last, last week. And I, I did all of the things that I shouldn't be doing about sugar and ice cream and um, good, good food, good drink, all of the things. So there was nothing Lenten about my week last week. 
Um, so my discipline really, it has been um, more focused on prayer and meditation. And I am uh, sort of a pray without ceasing kind of person or um, drive by prayer, but I am intentional um, during Lent and I have, uh, I have deliberate prayer time and I have things that I read. So what I've been reading, um, and I think Susan Carroll is on, and I'm glad she's here because she will recognize this. Um, Christmas Day, uh, my Christmas Day uh, sermon for the, the faithful ones who were gathered on the day, Christmas Day, you know how Christmas was this year. It fell on a Sunday. So that was a lot of church right there. Um, but I, I used um, Howard Thurman's uh, The Work of Christmas poem, which I have somewhere, I printed it out. There it is. If you remember the work of Christmas poem, um, when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the night is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. And the work of Christmas, Howard Thurman says, is to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people, to make music in the heart. And Susan and Mike, Susan Carroll, our harpist, and Mike Patch, who is also a musician, um, but is also technically gifted and works uh, with the technology at St. Paul's, um, put that to music. It was an arrangement um, that I can't remember who did it, Susan can tell you, um, but Susan learned the arrangement. And of course, she and Mike added their own creative um, flourish to it and um, they've recorded it and I'll put a link to that as well um, because that piece um, has informed our Lenten program which is um, looking outward from St. Paul's and looking at uh, the the work that our our parish is doing and that the wonderful outreach committee uh, I think Ann Riley Popper is on on here too and she has been a real leader in um and focusing outward uh, and being the hands and feet of Jesus and, um, and looking outside our doors. Uh, so um, the work of Christmas has, has led us to see what, what it is we have in our community, what the resources are and where St. Paul's is connected and where we can further connect um, in, in our local community. So um, Patty, you were there when Boys Home came and um, Interfaith Outreach and Daily Bread and a Boys and Girls Club and uh, the, the shelters, the um, domestic violence sh prevention shelter is coming next week. So we've had, I think, all together about 10 agencies that we're connected with that have shared their, um, their, their stories and their gifts on Miriam's house um, with, with the congregation, either on Sunday morning or uh, Wednesday evening, um, and with some opportunities for us to engage in the work. So Howard Thurman um, started me on this path. Of course, Howard Thurman, if you've done Sacred Ground, you've read um, Jesus and the Disinherited as part of that curriculum. Um, but I, I have been looking at a number of his poems or writings, and there's one that I've really um, returned to, and I would like to share it with you. Um, at the end, it's my, my poem for the end. So I'll save it for that. Uh, but that's what I've been reading. That was a long answer. Sorry. No, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing those. And I will send an email out at some point tomorrow with uh, resources that Nina's mentioned um, and other information so um, that you'll have access to that. So Nina, don't forget to send okay. those All right. to me. You, you'll remind me if I do. I'll remind you. <laughs> I'm the on task person in this mm -hmm. friendship. <laughs> We're both on task. Nope. We just do it at different paces. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> so, um, well, thank you so much. As we're coming to the end and, and talking about um, our journeys, and um, I it said at the first week, Lisa Kimball suggested that I ask each guest a question or two. Um, and, and everyone could hear different responses and, and I'll respond as well. Um, and so one of the questions came to my mind, um, I didn't want to give people just one word, um, but 
five words that describe your faith journey? I played with this a little bit. <laughs> That's a hard question. Um, so um, I have two answers. It's not 10 words. It's two separate answers. Okay. All right. It's all right. Are. We won't deduct from your final score. <laughs> all right. Thank you. You can give me a B. All right. <laughs> so one, one is roads converge. We walk together. That was sort of us. Okay. And all of us. And then the other one is one God together. We're one. And, and that comes really from my experience last week in Sedona. Um, I don't know if anybody's been to Sedona before, but it's kind of the woo-woo place. And uh, there's all kinds of stuff, you know, chakra and Buddhism and all this. So there was a lot going on. And I thought, you know what? It's all, we speak different languages, but it's all one God. It's the same God. And that was a great realization. I mean, I knew it before, but it was just made manifest uh, in that space and time. So one, one God together, we're one. Okay. I've been putting five words together for a sentence and just for you, my, um, and I, I think this is my faith journey because it, it really is true. Yes. I was taking the easy way out in English because I thought like, how could I go wrong to writing about God? But um, so my five words about my faith journey, God is my best friend. Thank you. I love it. That's good. That, and that is your faith journey. And it did get you that good grade. Yeah. B. I'm okay with a B. B is good. Um, it's probably your low bar. It was my high bar. That was my reach. <laughs> What's your favorite church word? I thought about this too. And this comes from childhood. Um, so my favorite church definition is sacrament, the outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. Sacrament. My favorite. Can I ask everybody else to put their favorite word in the chat? That'd be great. If, if you all would. Um, you don't have to. Chat box if you're willing and put What's your favorite church word? I've been taking a different word each week because um, I don't, I hope, I don't know. Somebody can catch me if I, I use the same one, but um, I will go this week um, blessed um, from that poem. And I love Ann Weems poetry and truly blessed um, by friendships and companions along the way. Um, all those folks on this Zoom tonight. So yeah, look at this, these great words. Yeah, that's good. Faith, joy, worship, grace. Keep them coming. Amen. Mm -hmm. Servant. Servant. And as I learned at, at boys' home um, with the boys, I went there on Ash Wednesday. So I um, recorded their session earlier before any of these started. And the boys were telling me, um, I don't know if it started um, from the uh, Annie Lamott book, um, hers is Help, Thanks, Wow, I think. And um, the boys do Thanks, Help, Wow uh, prayers on Wednesday. So Nina, what's your thanks today? My thanks is for this uh, faithful, this community of faith and all who are gathered um, on the screen. I'll thank, give thanks for each of you. Thank you for giving your time. Thank you for your hearts. Thank you for your ministry um, in your parishes and in your worlds. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there. I'm so thankful for the number of companions on this journey. Um, that I get to walk with. Um, it's a gift. Help. I didn't pre, I didn't, I forgot about this part. Help, <laughs> help, uh, help me to, um, help me to uh, listen for that still small voice that guides me. Help me to follow, help me to follow you. Yeah, um, I, I will say help to be still um, for me. There's a, sometimes, as I've said before, there's a lot of busy, busyness in church work mm -hmm. and I forget to be about my faith work and, and help to be still. 
Let me tell one and, more story about St. Paul's real quick. Yeah. That was a, a real awareness for me um, that uh, the gift of feeling in the right place at the right time before I was called to St. Paul's, I was standing and I was subbing for Todd and Diane and I was standing in the space and aware of God's presence while driving the train that I was able to worship and, um, and be present while, while serving at the altar. And uh, that felt like a, a, a good awareness for me to have uh, because it is important to maintain that awareness of worship, the need. Yeah. And I saw that was somebody's word, Susan Carroll, that was your word. Um, worship is so important. So yes, thank you. What's your wow today? My wow was the weather and the um, being outside and um, the beauty of God's creation. And I've been, you might've heard this two or three times already tonight in Sedona, in case you missed it, which is just an amazing place. Grand Canyon, went to see the Grand Canyon. So that was a big wow, but you know what? There's wow right here. It's gorgeous today flowers blooming and green and sky it was it was a big wow to be in the beauty of God's creation right here yeah I, I know wow for me is I got four good walks in with my dog um and and wow she's not making a peep because she's yeah. so tired <laughs> yeah my dog didn't get the four walks sorry so um, Nina, thank you so much for sharing your faith journey with us and, and walking with us tonight and walking with many of us. But before we go, I would ask that you would end us in prayer. My prayer is the Howard Thurman poem that I uh, told you I had for you. And um, this is a, a humbling poem. Um, some of it uh, is, is hard. So um, I invite you into the space and you will have a link to it. It's called I Confess. The concern which I lay bare before God today is my concern for the life of the world in these troubled times. I confess my own inner confusion as I look out upon the world. There is food for all. Many are hungry. There are clothes enough for all. Many are in rags. There is room enough for all. Many are crowded. There are none who want war. Preparations for conflict abound. I confess my own share of the ills in the times. I have shirked my own responsibilities as a citizen. I have not been wise in casting my ballot. I have left to others a real interest in making a public opinion worthy of democracy. I have been concerned about my own little job, my own little security, my own shelter, my own bread. I have not really cared about jobs for others, security for others, shelter for others, bread for others. I have not worked for peace. I want peace, but I have voted and worked for war. I have silenced my own voice that it may not be heard on the side of any cause. However right, if it meant running risks, or damaging my own little reputation. Let thy light burn in me that I may from this moment on take effective steps within my own powers to live up to the light and courageously pay for the kind of world I so deeply desire. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And thank you all for being with us this evening. I hope you'll join us next week as Martha Berlakis will be my guest for companions along the way. Until then, good night and may God bless you.